Congregation, it is a delight to see you here this morning on this beautiful Lord's Day. We're always delighted when you've chosen to be with us here at the Waters Road Church of Christ. And if you are a visitor, you are indeed our special guest this morning. I've already had an opportunity to meet several of you, but I hope that before you leave this, these grounds on this day, that I have an opportunity to meet you and say hello. Thank you for the reading of Scripture this morning, for the opportunity now to stand before you and deliver Another message from God's Word. I'm going to start this morning by asking you to do something a little bit different with me this morning. It's not a hard request, but you will find that the request will be something that hopefully will cause you to stop and think this morning. I'm going to ask you to repeat these words with me. All right? These are the words, and then we'll do it again, and you can repeat them. These are the words, I will let go and let God. So I want you to repeat those words with me, right? All right, together. I will let go and let God. Say it again. I will let go and let God. Now those words that just came from your lips, do you mean them? Do you even understand fully what it means to let go and let God? Because nowhere throughout Scripture do we find these four words, let go and let God, exemplified more than the story that Mike just read for us this morning. Nowhere in Scripture do we find a test so unique and so dramatic as the test here that the father of the faithful Abraham would be put under on this day. And yet as I stand here this morning, I preach this message, the story of Abraham and of his life and the promise of Abraham and that of the son that he dreamed of, the promised son that would be Isaac. And yet never in his thought price would have ever occurred that one day God would ask him to take his son there upon this mountain for this reason. Now, I know that you love tests, right? Everybody in this room loves taking tests, right? We just, we look forward to it every day. We think, oh, where can I get a good test to take today? No, none of us feel that way. It starts when we're in grade school, right? And especially the standardized test, you know, the fill in the blank. How many of you did like I did and just played tic-tac-toe with the, with the blanks? I mean, standardized testing, all the testing that we do in life, we get adjusted to the fact that at some point in time, we are going to be tested. But you ever stop and think that there's going to come a time in your life that God is going to test you? Do you ever stop to think that there's ever going to come a point in your life where God is going to say, all right, now let's see how you answer these questions. But you might ask me, Jonathan, what are these questions that God might ask of me? Today we're going to learn those questions. And we're going to see how it is that a faithful individual who loves God, who fully trusts in God, is willing and able to answer these questions. Because the first thing that we must understand when God tests us, He is testing our faith. It is a test of our faith. So when we talk about testing of the faith, God says, okay, now in this case, in Abraham's case, we've heard the story read, we know what it entailed, but here is the first question that God not only asked Abraham, but is asking you this morning, and this is the question, who do you love the most? Stop and think about it. I know you're tempted to think about lunch. I know you're tempted to think about a lot of things, but I'm asking you, just for a moment, stop, answer this question. Honestly, who do you love the most? Now look at that verse that's there upon the screen. It would have been enough if God had simply said, take your son. But no, he qualified that statement in three ways. The first thing he says your only son, not forgetting Ishmael, by the way, who was also his son, but meaning that Isaac was his promised son. Isaac, the son whom 
Abraham and Sarah had waited for so many years. Third, whom you love. I mean, it almost seems like God might have been mocking Abraham here. But these words were meant to reassure Abraham that God knew. God absolutely knew what he was requesting of Abraham. This is your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. By saying it in this way, Abraham would understand. Abraham would understand that there was a cost, a cost to obey God. Now let us be clear about what was being asked of Abraham at this point. Let us be clear about what God was asking at this very point. He wanted Abraham to travel with his son to Moriah, which today, by the way, is known as Jerusalem. And he says, I want you to build an altar out of stones on one of the mountains. He would then make a platform of wood on these stones. Then Abraham was to ask Isaac, listen, ask him to lay down on this wood. Then he would take a knife and cut Isaac's throat in the same way that a sacrificial lamb was slain. And finally, after all that, if that were not enough, then he would light that wood burning his son's body as an offering to God. Folks, this is what God told Abraham to do. And at that point, the man of faith, every man of faith, when God tests you, has two options. Either you obey or you don't. If you stop to argue, that's a sign of disobedience. If you try to talk God out of it, that too is disobedience. If you say, God, but why don't we try this instead? An alternate plan, that too is also disobedience. A lot of us in this room this morning have a lot of things that we love. Be honest with yourself. What do you love so much in your life right now that you have a hard time even imagining letting go of that thing? And then ask yourself once again the question, who do you love the most? The second question is this. Who do you trust the most? Now, I'm going to tell you something this morning that's very personal for me. I was not a child of promise. See, my mother and father had three children. Randy, Shell, and Billy. And they're all much older than me. And when Billy was a a four-year-old, a young child, God decided it was time for Billy to go home to be with God in heaven. The death of a child. There may be those in this room this morning that understand what it feels like to lose a child. Let me tell you what someone once said about the death of a child. They said, the death of a child is like putting a period before the end of a sentence. And in this case, God told Abraham to offer his own son, and Abraham was fully prepared to do it. So prepared, in fact, that Hebrews 11 verse 17, that's in your New Testament, by the way, actually says that Abraham offered 
Isaac as a sacrifice, meaning that when he laid his son down upon that altar and raised the knife, he fully intended on putting his son, his son to death. Naturally, I, I, my mind, I don't know about yours, but my mind focuses on that aspect because it's so poignant and so personal. But God wants us to think about something else. God had already promised to make Abraham the head of a great nation. And, and through that nation, to bring great blessings to the entire world. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And God had said that he would bring forth that nation from Isaac's descendants. But that couldn't happen if Isaac, who was only a young man at this point, was dead. So here we're faced with what seems to be an enormous contradiction. So God had commanded Abraham to offer his son Isaac but God had promised to bring forth offspring through Isaac. And that promise and that command flatly contradicted each other. If Abraham obeys the command, does that not cancel out the promise since Isaac would have been dead? If he disobeys the command, what would happen to the promise? Here, my friends, good brethren, is a shining, amazing, beyond this world character of Abraham's faith. He didn't know. He did not know how God was going to do it. He just knew God would do it somehow. And herein lies the lesson for everybody in this room that I hope you'll listen to this morning. When God makes you a promise... It is folly and disbelief to wonder how God is going to keep his word. When God promises you that he's going to do something, don't sit around all day questioning, God, how are you going to do it? Just simply trust because faith does not reckon with the how. Faith believes and leaves the how up to God to handle. That's why we started this lesson with the words, let go and let God. Because if we spend too much of our lives trying to figure out how God's going to take care of us, we're likely to talk ourselves into a corner. And as you ponder this amazing story this morning, I want you to remember that Abraham had no true idea, none, of about what was going to happen to he and Isaac as they started on this three-day journey to Moriah. That is, he set out to obey God, knowing the one who had called him to offer his beloved son, knowing that that God whom he trusted would answer the how. There are times in life, I think many times, when God tells us, Jonathan, your only job right here, right now, is to take the next step. And we aren't called by God. God doesn't say, okay. Benjamin, I want you to figure out the how right now. You figure it out by yourself. Phil, you figure it all out by yourself. No, God doesn't do that to us. God says, go, and we go. God says, stop, and we stop. He says, give me your dearest possession, and we offer it to him. That's the true life of someone who has faith in God. So I'm asking you this morning, who do you trust the most? Some of us feel like the only person we can trust is ourself. 
A lot of us don't trust other people. A lot of us just feel like if I'm going to get anything done in life, it's up to me. But I'm telling you this morning, there should be no one you trust other than God and Him alone. He will never let you down. But if you trust in God, know that He will provide those in your life that will help you to carry through the moments where you're called to act on faith. And that brings us to the third question. Who do you fear the most? If I stopped you in the back of this auditorium this morning as you walk out those doors and I ask you, each and every one of you, do you have an idol? I'm not talking about Billy Idol. I'm asking you, do you have an idol this morning? Most people would say, no, not me. But the truth is, a lot of us have idols that we do not recognize that exist in our life. Could your spouse be your idol? Yes. Could your family be your idol? Yes. Could your children be your idol? Could your money be your idol? Could your ministry be your idol? Could your career be your idol? The answer to all those is yes. Is there anything wrong with being married? No. Is there anything wrong with having a family, raising their children, making some money, having a career, getting an education, having a ministry, making your way in the world, or even having something to show for it? Is there anything wrong inherently with those things? The answer is no. It's all good. But anything good can still become your idol. And the moment that it becomes your idol is the moment you no longer say, I'm willing to let go and let God. A lot of us aren't willing to admit that we fear losing something more than we fear God. Many of us in this room, if we're honest with ourselves this morning, fear so many things more than we do God. But the Bible tells us very clearly that the beginning of knowledge is fear. And if you have fear in God, I'm talking about that reverential fear, not the fear that you have of the rattlesnake. I'm talking about the fear that says, God, you are that great God above all gods. You are the one that made the mountains. You are the ones that formed the dry lands. You made all of these things. And if you've got all that power, then I'm going to fall down on my knees at your request. Who do you love the most? Who do you trust the most? Who do you fear the most? You see, that's the three questions that God is asking you. He's already asked Abraham. Abraham answered these questions and did so as the father of the faithful. But if they were writing the book about you, if the story was written about you this morning... How would it read? Would it read, Love God the most, trust God the most, fear God the most? Because those of us that can answer that question, that set of questions this morning, then we know that there is only one way to walk. And that is, we must walk by faith. And how do we walk by faith? There are three ways we walk by faith. Number one, we walk by faith in the past with God. Abraham already understood what it meant to walk by faith in the past with God. By the way, go back and read Genesis chapter 12. It's an amazing thing how we think all these heroes of the Bible just led these perfectly faithful lives. Nope, not Abraham. Olabe had some problems early on in his walk. But he looked back and he realized, God has been faithful to me. 
regardless of the fact that I've messed up a few times along the way. And that should teach us to have faith in God, even in our weakness. But also he had faith in the promises of God. He didn't have to sit around all day and figure out how God was going to do it. And third, he had faith in the plan of God. Do you have faith in those things this morning? Someone once told me this, and I think it's so true. That God is the great conductor of life. He orchestrates the affairs of life, the good and the bad, the happy and the sad, to bring us to a place where our faith will be not in everything else, but in Him alone. Slowly but surely, as we go through this life, God weans us away from the things of this world. At first, that process of weaning touches our possessions, which we can replace. But then, eventually, it touches our relationships, which may not be replaced. It doesn't stop there, though. Then it touches our loved ones, does it not? Which cannot be replaced. And finally, it touches life itself, which is never replaced. Then and only then, there is nothing left but us and God. Is that you this morning? Whenever I tell this story, I always try to make this point. Hold lightly what you value greatly. Say it with me. Hold lightly what you value greatly. Why? Because it doesn't belong to you anyway. Every time I've said that over the years, people kind of nod their heads because they know it's true. It was Christ himself who asked this question. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Mark chapter 8 and verse 36. Maybe that's a lot of our problem in this room this morning. Maybe that's our problem. We've gained so much that we don't dare less, let go and we lose the whole world. And somewhere in the process of trying to hold on to the world, we lose our soul. There are rewards, good brethren, this morning for being faithful to God. I trust in these rewards. For Abraham, just at the moment, as he had laid his son upon that altar of sacrifice, raised the knife in preparation to do the unthinkable, you heard, as the scripture was read, how the story turned. Abraham looked, and behold, there was a ram caught in a thicket. You see, what Abraham understood at that very moment, and I hope everyone will understand this today, that when it comes to your life, if you are faithful to God, God will always provide a way. God will always provide a way. And not only will he do that. But when you trust God and you have faith in God that no matter what the request may be, instead of anything, you're like Abraham. When God calls, you say, here I am. When God calls, you say, here I am. 
Have anybody called your children recently? When you got children in your household and they're a little bit disobedient and you call them out when you say, Hey! And you give their name. If they ever say, What do you want? Oh! Sound like Donkey Kong. <laughs> if you ever want to start walking with God when God calls... You don't ask how, you don't ask why, you just say, here I am, God. Because when you do that, you develop a closeness with God that goes beyond imagination. And I'm talking about an intimacy with God. Look at verse 14 there. Abraham called the place the Lord will provide to this very day my brethren that same mount is known for the same thing you don't think people haven't trusted in this story people believe and they trust that God will provide If you've ever stopped to think about the parallel between this story and our Savior Jesus Christ, let me make it even clearer for you this morning. Abraham offered his son. The father offered his son. Isaac carried the wood. Jesus carried the cross. Isaac was laid upon the altar. Jesus was nailed to the cross. Abraham was willing to put his son to death. The father willed that his son should die. The ram was offered in the place of Isaac. Christ was offered in the place of sinners. Abraham received his son back figuratively. Jesus literally rose from the dead. Here's the deal. You can keep this world for a moment, but you'll have to give it up eventually in the end. Or you can keep your soul by letting go and letting God. You can let God take care of the things that were never yours to begin with. So the question for everybody as we end this lesson, what is your Isaac? And are you willing to lay it down for Jesus' sake? This morning, if you're not a Christian, you're holding on tight to something, aren't you? Something that doesn't belong to you. You're holding on to your pride. You're holding on to selfish ambition. Maybe you've got a whole laundry list of things that you've got to cast away. The rich young ruler came up to Jesus and said, How can I have this great thing that you are offering? And Jesus said, Well, here's the first thing. All your possessions, let go and let God. The rich young ruler said, That's too much to ask. And he went away with tears in his eyes. Will you walk out of this door this morning sad because you're not willing to let go of something that you don't even own to begin with? The message is yours this morning. If you are in need of response to the invitation, the encouragement song will be sung. The opportunity is here. There'll be elders in the back. If you need to pray privately, if we can help you in any way this morning, would you please come as we stand and sing?